Welcome, I'm J. Michael Silver, and this is Foundational Steps, the show where I talk with people about the choices they've made and how they get to where they are in life now. In this episode, I'm talking with Chris Holbrook. She's an amazing artist, graphic designer, real estate investor, and now she's building a regenerative farm. We talk about not being invisible as a woman, wanting to be invisible, and finding the depths of herself on the path to personal growth. Links to Chris and timestamps for everything that came up are in the show notes. Please support the show by leaving a comment or a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts and check out our affiliate links in case there's something valuable for you. Enjoy our conversation. <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Um, so I, I want to I start off. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. I want to start off and I just want to ask you uh, a question that hope hopefully hits hits a chord with you, which is when uh, or what was the first moment that you realized that you were conscious, that you were making choices in this life and you were like, this was all real, like you're doing this thing. And does that make sense? Uh, in the literal way, as in my first moment of consciousness yep. as a human being yep that you can that you that you knew that you were alive and like something more is going on than you know whatever whatever came before huh uh i'd say i was aware of being alive being a being a kid but making choices being aware of anything beyond that uh I'd say when I was 18. <laughs> That's fair. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I've only recently started to ask this question specifically. And I always point to my first moment uh, or one of my first moments because I had a few when I was a child, but the first one that really was stark um, was when I was in like kindergarten and I was on stage and uh, I had a prop malfunction with... Um, you know, during the performance, I was holding a, a branch and there was a little piece of bread on the end of the branch. And I was like playing the season of fall and I had a few little lines and the bread fell off and the bread wasn't supposed to fall off. And all these people were looking at me, other people were relying me on, on stage. And it was this moment of like intense, uh, you know, kind of awareness of the present moment, what was happening that shouldn't be happening. And so that was kind of my first moment. And a friend of mine um, who we used to live together 20 some years ago, uh, his first real moment, uh, he stated it was, I think he was 22 or 23 at the time. So I don't think there's any wrong answer. Um, so let's go with 18 and tell me what happened at 18 that made you go, oh shit, this is real. Uh, thank you. That sounds like a tense moment of your childhood for sure. <laughs> um, 18 was when my, my parents, uh, were going to move away or rather my father was a diplomat. So I grew up overseas because he was stationed in different cities overseas. So when I was 18, I was living in Paris, France. Mm -hmm. Um, and my dad had to move somewhere else. He had a new assignment and I was in my last year of high school. And by this point I had moved, I had moved eight times, eight different schools. I That's mean, a lot. Uh, so I said, can I please stay here and just finish high school? <laughs> and my parents were really great about that. And they said, yes. And they, um, they rented a little, like, there's like a little unit in, um, I don't know what to call it there. Let's say it was like a little studio space that happened to be behind one of my friend's houses who lived near my school. Okay. So they rented that space for me. And then I was alone for the first time in my whole life. That's a big deal. <laughs> actually alone. And this was like a space that didn't have internet and whatnot. And this is 2007. Um, and being alone for the first time and, and nobody around, I realized, oh, I've just been a, I've just been a reflection of what other people want me to be my whole life. I didn't mm -hmm. know what it was like to be away from my parents. I didn't know that I could 
not be afraid of my mom. I didn't know who I was at all. All I knew was, oh, I've just been putting on a show for my entire life. That's a big moment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's huge. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, when you asked, so I, I guess I should just assume this and then ask, <laughs> um, but it, because it seems uh, self-evident, but when you asked, can I finish school here? Did you have even the slightest bit of clue that you were going to uh, end up so alone and, and have any kind of like that self-realization moment? No. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't assume you would. I mean, it, it kind of seems like one of those things, like how could you possibly know? But what were, what were the, what was the thinking? Like, did you have any plan of, of how you were going to live or was that talked about with your parents? Like what was the situation around all of that? Um, very little communication, honestly. That's just my family dynamic. Okay. It was just as little as possible. Uh, but my mom kind of thought, oh, yeah, if she goes and she's living by herself, then she can figure out how to live on her own when she's in college. And so it was just kind of like, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the time is right. It's, it's kind of like perfect timing almost for from their mind, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, they didn't mind. And I'm the youngest child and my two older brothers, they had already left. And I think they were just kind of like, you're fine. <laughs> Yeah, they trusted you and they knew that you had made good decisions and, you know, or no? Oh, yeah. I think um, I lived a very inoffensive life as a child. <laughs> I then... love that. I lived a very inoffensive life. <laughs> That's a wonderful way of putting it. Yeah, I was just very used to, like, following rules. Mm -hmm. Most of my upbringing was in Asia. And then my mother is Taiwanese. So my upbringing is kind of like, you follow rules, you do well in school, and you just be quiet and you're good and make sure to cater to other people's needs. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And while also being a, a, the daughter of a diplomat, I mean, there's got to be lots of rules around being in a diplomatic family, no? I suppose so. I was just already so shy that it, it didn't matter. Well, there's, mm. I, I couldn't do anything anyway. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So did you feel like you had like good coping mechanisms? Like, did you feel like you have any coping mechanisms once you found yourself alone? You know, you're, you're in Paris, you're in this little studio, uh, living space and like, you've come to realize that you, you've just been playing this role of dutiful daughter and inoffensive life. And, um, I mean, did you have the, the coping me me mechanisms to, um, get through it or did you, were you scrambling or, or having great anxiety over how to do this once you had that awakening? Hmm. Let me think about that. Uh, I would say I experienced crushing feelings, lots of laying down on my bed, listening to like massive attack and crying. And I did a lot of art. Like I did, I was just painting and drawing and throwing paint at the walls at my school. I had the best art teacher who basically was like, do whatever you want. And so I did. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I would draw a lot and paint a lot. And in my drawings and paintings, I would kind of like write, I guess kind of like free association. Mm -hmm. Someone just sort of like, what is the point? why anything? What's going on? So you really found yourself asking really, honestly, deep, profound questions. I mean, they may have, it may sound, you know, a, a little bit contrite to say that, but I mean, I feel like that really is, you know, what those questions are, is they really are deep, profound questions that, you know, people spend a lifetime in a monastery, mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about. And was that, ever part of your life before was yeah. the art part of your life before yeah I'd always been drawing but I never was in this place where at, at that time I was just like I don't want to do anything else mm. Mm -hmm. so it became kind of your um your I mean that became your coping mechanism really it was art 
and and finding ways to express and ask these questions and you know look for answers yeah i'd say it was like how i could process what i was going through that was my way of movement did you find answers in that in that state or did you find more questions or both yes <laughs> i'd say um uh i would have questions struggle with them find some sort of conclusion struggle more have a new question struggle more but i yeah i had like a art journal that i would sort of write and i would write in these like big long circles of like ah oh, the answer is seeking the answer and you go down this hill and you go down this tunnel and you go over here and you go over here and then you realize there's nothing and there's nothing and there's nothing and there's nothing and i was just enjoying that <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I have, uh, you know, I've been studying philosophy most of my life to some extent, like not professionally, like I don't have a master's or a PhD in philosophy or anything like that, but I'm always trying to read books and, you know, look up people on the internet and understand, you know, different philosophical paradigms. And it seems to me that there's three primary, um, kind of influences that the modern world exists under. Uh, one is Socrates, uh, and they're all existed. They all kind of came into existence right around 2,500 years ago, which is kind of interesting. Um, so maybe the modern world, you could say, uh, is born out of these three individuals um, and their contemporaries. But so Socrates uh, was all about, you know, the Socratic method is, is basically talk, and find the meaning of words and find, you know, an understanding around the words and continue um, developing the understanding through a dialogue to come to a conclusion. And, um, and then the Buddha um, went inward, got really quiet with him, himself and went inward and found all the answers inside and was able to speak with great wisdom. Uh, as Socrates did through, you know, dialogue. And then um, Confucius uh, basically was do as I do, because you might get confused with what I say or misinterpret. But if you see something that you think is working for me, then if you do it, you can find the way that's right for you. And by doing what I do, you'll get to where you want to be. So, you know, the action, taking action, and doing it again and again and again until you get it right, uh, going in until you find the total stillness where you can feel, you know, the right path or or see the right path, uh, or talking it through. And it sounds like you were doing a combination of those three things. Yeah, as you were saying that, I was like, oh, I feel I feel all three of those somehow mixing and overlapping and changing. So I'm curious. Like that's one of the things that I want to do. Um, the more I talk with people is kind of feel out some of these theses that I have, I guess you, you know, say, um, and it's, it's just kind of an interesting thing to see it in other people and hear you talk about these things without even bringing it up first, because that sounds very much like what your process was. Mm -hmm. So once you started down that path and you were questioning and coming up with answers and questioning and drawing and creating art, like obviously at some point in time, you graduated high school. So did that kind of coping mechanism then hold true? And did you start to develop that and, and shape that for when you went to university or did you go to university? Yeah, I went to art school. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Well, let me take another step back actually in this period. And this was, yeah, I'd say the summer after I graduated from high school, I was basically thinking, I don't know how to live. I don't know what I like. I don't know what I want. I don't know who I am. I want to see how other people live. Mm -hmm. So I literally went up to people. I went up to strangers and I would ask them if I could interview them. Oh, that's amazing. And, and I would ask them like who they were, their background, um, anything they kept on them, their family relationship, 
why they thought they were alive and what for. Um, and, and like, mm -hmm. this, this was all in Paris. Uh huh. Yeah. And this is all from who you just prior to this experience you described as a as a um, inoffensive, uh, shy girl who um, who wasn't overly <laughs> outward. And you started just interviewing people to find out who they were and how they got where they're at. How they live. Yeah. How they live. That's amazing. Well, I think in the sense of like, and I'll give myself credit for this. When I feel terrible, when I felt terrible as a, as a child, I didn't try to get out of it. I would just feel horrible. Mm -hmm. and I would just go as deeply into feeling horrible as possible. And basically like, this is it. This is the end. I hate my life or, you know, yeah. I wouldn't be like, let me cope with this. I'd be like, I fucking hate this and just go into it. I mean, if I may, I feel like that is a coping me mechanism because, um, so you were coping just maybe not in the conventional way. You weren't, you weren't going towards it. Yeah. Because yeah. I did the same thing. Like I had a horrible fear of my basement as a, as a child, I had a basement and there was a furnace down there and it was pitch black down there and the furnace made noises and I had vivid imagination. And so I would sit on the top of the stairs to the basement and look into the darkness and sit there for as long as I could and eventually move further down the stairs without turning the lights on. Yeah. And then at some point in time, uh, we had a, a it was a walk-in closet, but a small walk-in closet. Like it was big enough for like, one adult to kind of walk into and you could kind of you had some coats here and some coats here um but it was it was like right here you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and we had so much junk in there so much jackets and boots and everything else and i would go in that closet um and sit down in the back of the closet and put like the coats in front of me so that i was against the wall to be in complete darkness because i wanted to be more comfortable in the darkness. And um, so I, I, I did a very, very similar thing. So I, I think that is a coping mechanism. Um, and I think that is a very powerful coping mechanism because it forces you to deal with yourself in a way that culturally as Americans, we are not encouraged to do. Um, and especially guys, but I think, I think, uh, gals as well. Um, and maybe more now, maybe, maybe it's more accepted now, but yeah. Yeah. I agree that there's a cultural, um, disdain for anything unpleasant in general. Yeah. I mean, I think it's maybe just, maybe not even the United States, maybe it's a Western world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did, did from your mom's perspective or from your mom's side of the family, um, was there an avoidance of, of pain or, um, because you said she was very much into people pleasing and very much, you know, kind of taught you to, mm -hmm. to be a pleaser and to, you know, make things nice. Yes. I'd say culturally, um, my experience anyway, this might not be true in general, uh, that I was taught that you know, if there's pain, you keep it inside. You have to make sure you have a good image on the outside. You, mm. And that means individually or as a family, as a unit, um, that anything unpleasant or painful or chaos is, is kept tucked away nicely. And you make sure you have something pretty on top of it. So when you started doing this deep diving into yourself, uh, you're 18, you're all alone. You're starting to interview people. Um, was that a, a difficult thing? I mean, you spent 18 years tucking things away and, and putting on the facade and playing the character of, you know, dutiful daughter and, and, uh, inoffensive, I still love that, uh, inoffensive life. Um, was, was there a difficulty in this new identity that you were discovering? Like, mm -hmm. was there any holding on to that old identity or? or no, in what ways that you might well, have let's see i'd say that it was i was 
I had come to the realization that my whole existence was feeling very painful because I wasn't even myself in the first place. Right. So I didn't feel like it was very difficult for me to, at the time, what it felt like was that I was putting on another costume because I didn't know what was inside anyway. Mm -hmm. I had such a disconnection from my own feelings and thoughts that I, I didn't even know what was genuine to me anyhow. So I was, I was fine with that. I also took off the label of beautiful daughter as <laughs> best I could. I cut off all my hair and dressed in men's clothes, basically, because I didn't want to be noticed anymore either. Hmm. And dressing as a man, you thought, or, or a stereotypical, you know, I, I male identity you felt was a, a way to become invisible? And I did, too. Huh. And not, not that I was trying to be male passing or anything. It was just that I wore baggy clothes, right? had short hair, because that was also a, a big shock for me was I moved to Paris when I was 16, coming from Asia my whole life. And in Paris, they have a whole different um, relationship with sexuality and yeah. they're open and speak to women freely. Um, and I had just gone through puberty and I was getting all this information basically that other people thought I was attractive or that they, they wanted to touch me or things like that. And so this was also a huge, like, what is, what's going on? I didn't have that experience before. Yeah, I get that. <sighs> it's interesting. I think it's overlooked, um, but men go through the same thing or boys go through the same thing. I mean, I went through it. I, I used I don't know that it's come up in any of other episodes, but Justin Bieber, I think is the perfect example because he was hypersexualized at like 15, mm -hmm. um, by men and women. And, you know, it doesn't get talked about and it gets overlooked, but it happens to all children. Um, if they fit a certain, you know, paradigm or generic, you know, idea of what beauty is and, there's a show called Euphoria right now on HBO. Um, it's getting some press because of uh, of you know there's a there's a stigma that's attached to it is it's glamorizing drug use, um, which to me it's a very honest portrayal of the ups and downs the and the highs and lows. Um, but what hasn't gotten a lot of press is the over-sexualization. We're seeing a lot of naked bodies in this show, if you watch the show, yeah. of, of male and female and, and trans. And, um, and these are all obviously 20-year-olds um, playing teenagers. So you're basically an audience member watching what's supposed to be a teenager, a nude or naked teenager uh, and various degrees of sex and sexuality. And for some reason or another, that's not being talked about. And like, to me, like maybe the drug issues wouldn't be as prevalent if you weren't over-sexualizing children and making them deal with, uh, a reality that, and then ignoring it. Um, so, I mean, in some ways I feel like the show is satirically doing it because they know they're doing it they're conscious of it um yet the media isn't picking it up and it's not being talked about um but i but i feel like to some extent that's what you're talking about going through you know the hypersexualization uh, of adults towards children and you being completely new to it because you had no awareness of your sexuality prior to that or very little um, no clarity mm -hmm. and, and then having to go through that and deal with that. So it makes sense that you would want to hide. Yes, it was definitely weird. And, uh, you know, the ideals or sort of like the vision of what beauty is, is so different from culture to culture to culture. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't necessarily considered like a beautiful person in one place and, or it would just it just seemed like it would change. And I remember having this thought, maybe I was like 15 of like, oh, I just kind of happened to fit what is um, celebrated in this day and age, but like, it's not intentional. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, yeah, it's the interesting thing about being an actor. It's like, I will go up for some things and just be told, no, you're not good looking enough. And I'll go up for other things and be told, no, you're too good looking. And it's like, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Uh, and, you know, being, uh, being a guy that goes and asks women out, um, you've got to, you know, act like you know what you're doing and, and act like you, you know, have some confidence, even if you don't, when you're, especially when you're younger, uh, and, you know, there's a whole role that you take on to try to fit what you think the narrative is or what the norm is and what, you know, and some, you know, people will be, oh my God, you're all of this. And then some, and other people don't want to even look at you because you were so not their thing for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's ironic to me that, you know, I'm a bit older than you. So when I was uh, 18 in the mid nineties, early mid nineties, um, there, there wasn't, it wasn't quite as, um, it just wasn't talked about, I feel like at all. And I don't, I think it's probably only even recently that it's talked about and it's starting to get, you know, kind of equal play, but there's still kind of a, it's a one-sided conversation. Uh, you know, that sexualization of children is, is primarily focused on what women go through. And, um, I think males, a lot of their ag aggression comes from wanting to get noticed and not getting noticed, uh, or thinking they should get noticed and not getting noticed or getting attention that they don't want. Um, you know, same, same exact same thing that women go through mm -hmm. and yet we also make it okay for men to lash out and well, not as much anymore, thankfully, but you know, to be, um, more outward in, in the anger where we ask previously asked women, uh, girls to keep it inside. It's just the, um, I don't know where we're going with this. this is a little bit off topic, but it's just kind of interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm hearing it as um, you're you're acknowledging the fact that there's there's this focus on on what women go through growing up, but there's this sounds like the invisible nature of like the development that a man goes through, where they're sort of being a male can be sort of dismissed and and not communicated with about this aspect of their sexuality and who they are. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm sure we could get deeper into that. I don't know that it's relevant right now. So that might be like a separate conversation for another time when we solve the problems of, of how to make you feel more seen and, and more supported. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know that we can do that uh, today. Um, but that could be uh, on the board for another conversation for another day to solve the, um, <laughs> the youth of today's uh, identity issues. Um, so moving a little bit forward in your life, you're in art school and you're you know dealing with these uh, identity issues. Is the are there other techniques that you've started to develop coping mechanisms or, or ways to deal with it? Or is art still prim the primary and or only method? Um, let's see, well, back in art school, what did I do? Who drank a lot. Uh, I, I thought actually I had another like sort of weird identity crisis entering college because when I was applying to art school, I was under this impression that what I was going through was what people who were making art would be going through. And this is what mm -hmm. we are doing when they're creating art is going through this um, processing of the difficulties of being alive or whatever. And when I arrived at art school, I found that that's not the case. Most of the students are just regular people who, I'm regular too, regular people who are going there because they want to get an art degree and they have to be very good at art. And so I was going in thinking we're going to have a lot of like conversations about this and life and why and existence and what does art mean and where can it go? And then I discovered I was just going to be surrounded by people who were going to focus on what made sense there, which is making art and doing homework. Mm -hmm. 
and getting high or, you know, normal, normal college experience stuff. So I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that, but I was no. kind of like, oh, uh, who, who do I talk to? Where do I go? So, I expected more out of college as well. I, I expected there to be more philosophical discussion and more, um, questioning questions on, you know, how, why, what, you know, all, all these things, all these philosophical things yeah. and, and how to deal with it all. And I also was very shocked that there was absolutely none of that. And in fact, if I asked questions in class, uh, most of the students got pissed off at me and some of the professors were game to play along and, and go down a rabbit hole with me and answer questions and talk about, you know, why or what or how, um, most felt I was a distraction. Mm -hmm. Um, I even got called into the office my freshman year by one, one professor. They're like, you know, it's really nice that you're, you're, you're thinking about these things and everything else, but you're distracting the other kids. Like that's not where they're at. And, mm -hmm. you know, we need to get to the curriculum and, and my parents thought it was a compliment. I thought it was like, don't be you, <laughs> but she, that she was scolding me for, for wanting more out of my education. Um, yeah. yeah. No more questions. Yeah. Gosh. Just regurgitate. Just do the work, regurgitate, be a good, be a good cog in the machine. That's, that's what we want you to be like, uh, no, yes. thanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That it's sort of like, well, here's, here's what's happening. And, uh, these are the rules and you just do that. That, that was weird to me. Yeah. So when did like, or, or did you find a breakout where you got to kind of live your life a little bit more fully in the way you wanted with other people in the same way that you wanted? Like, did you find that uh, after school, in school, or at what point did you find that? Hmm, that's a broad question. But I'll, I'll go with the, well, at first, before I went to art school, I kind of had this sense of like, well, I'm not sure what to do or how to live. So I'm just going to be open and try anything and everything and uh, keep what works and toss out what doesn't like that was That's my awesome. goal at that time and then at, around the same time I was I was um I was getting very like excited about very specific things like oh this guy I like or like this concert I want to go to and these things were um what if they didn't happen the way that I wanted them to I would be devastated how often did they happen the way you wanted them to rarely but <laughs> yes it was it was just having that happen enough and me having these like I would have these weird free rights I would do I was also coming to the conclusion that uh when I when I judge things as good or bad that's it's it I just get stressed out disappointed da, 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 da. but if I can accept everything for the way it is I don't have to be happy because I'll be at peace. Yeah. So that was my, my other, my two things coming into art school was like, I want to try to accept everything for the way it is. And I want to be open to anything. That's really beautiful. I think. Um, so how long did it take for that to kind of become your, your normal existence that, you know, you're being open and I mean, was it immediate or did you struggle with that and in, in the acceptance? I am still struggling with that. I have, I get older, I become conditioned by a new thing that I'm in, then I get attached to that, then I start having judgmental thoughts, and then I do that, and then I get stuck on wanting things to happen a certain way, and then I let go of that, and I remember who I am, and then I forget, so I think that's just my life, so I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> No, it's cool that you're cool with that. I, I do think that there is a, 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 I don't know. I think it's a common thread that we figure things out uh, and then we forget them and then we figure them out again. And I, I have a working idea that we forget what we figured out because we don't have the, the facility to put them into action. Mm -hmm. So if we were if we were to figure something out like, you know, oh, 
I want to eat better. I don't know. I'm and that's mundane. And we're talking about, you know, other things, but just to simplify it, I want to eat better. But if you don't know how, and you don't know where to find that information to eat better, and you start looking and it gets really confusing really quickly as it does, because there's so much crap out there on this fad or that fad, then you kind of get defeated and realize that, you know, it's not as easy. You don't know how to do it. And then you fall back into an old pattern until you get sick or something happens. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I really need to eat better. And then like, God, why didn't I do this before? I know I knew this before. And then it's the cycle all over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of the things that, you know, foundational steps is all about is making it easier. So when people recognize like, oh, I'm going through that now. Like I'm hoping that, you know, they, you know, find you or find one of the other guests on, on social media or reach out to me or become part of the community so that, you know, people can start figuring out what they need to get out of those cycles so that they don't have to, you know, relive over and over again and rediscover over and over again. Gotcha. I don't know. I I mean, do you think that you're ability to, um, like you come upon, you come have some realization and then you forget it. Do you think it tracks with what I'm saying? Like if you had the facility to, you know, put, put it into action and put what you figured out into action, you would have not had to learn it again and rediscover that again. Hmm. Well, I think in a way, well, I can see like steps as I'm going up improving mm-hmm. i'd say i'm like i feel like i'm doing an upward spiral yeah i like that slow. i can't necessarily i might fall fall back into a pattern or do something do something that i used to do in the past that i don't want to do anymore but i find myself doing again uh my original idea for a logo was actually steps that go uh, steps that go oh, around sorry. like that. Yeah. I didn't want it to be a, a hard spiral because I thought that was a little too on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't. There's no there was no um, um, iteration that looked right to me. And mm-hmm. when Ash came up with the the logo that I'm using now it just made sense I was like yeah that's it I'm going with that and I can always change it later but like that's that's it it's simple it's easy <laughs> it's straightforward yeah, it. yeah. yeah. but I, I I love that that it's a spiral staircase and so you're kind of coming back but you're coming at coming back on it from a higher level yeah and and I'm you know it's I'm going to say this and it might not be true I have a terrible memory I think uh, that when I'm falling back into a place where I'm feeling gripped by anxiety or fear or um, judgmental thoughts about how I am or what I'm doing, it's not that like I have to refigure out and remember that thing. Mm. In a way it is, it's more like, it's because of my perspective alone. It's just the perspective shift for me. So it's reframing what's going on that helps you. That makes a lot of sense. I, I, I would say I do more of that than anything else for myself, my own kind of coping mechanisms. It's, it's reframing. It's like, okay, like, I know I'm not in the same position as I was before because I've got this, this, and this going on. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still missing this. And then I start looking for how to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. And I've yeah. also found myself going up a lot of stairs just because it's curious and it's interesting where it's not really beneficial. Like it's not my path, but it's interesting. So I go up and I spend a lot of time going this direction and then I kind of get up there and I'm like, okay, great. (laughs) Anyways, (laughs) back to what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah. And, And I think where that comes from is really important too, of like what we're like naturally drawn to. Mm-hmm what piques our curiosity and what we feel energized to do that's easy the energy of that kind of movement in our life versus the ah, i should do this i should be better i should xyz whatever it is where where it comes from like the motivation in there is like um saying basically we shouldn't be the way we are or there's something wrong with the way we are and we shouldn't be so bad um so I think the, the action of whatever we're doing is not 
as important as where it comes from inside or, or why I'm doing it. Am, am I thinking of myself as being, maybe I haven't voiced it out loud in my head, like I'm, I'm doing this because I think I'm shitty and I've got to fix myself or am I doing it because I feel that natural childlike curiosity like you're describing it, like what's up there? That's cool, going back to what I'm doing. Yeah, and for better or for worse, my natural curiosity has taken me on some uh, amazing epic journeys um, mentally, physically, you know, emotionally, you know, because of exploring some things. So I definitely wouldn't give them up. Um, and I feel like for me, because of my path and what I'm doing, I've been lucky, um, or unintentionally, um, guided by, learning things because I'm always wanting to, like I have, I, my parent, both my parents were teachers when I was a child before they became entrepreneurs. So I always have some innate desire to share knowledge and to share experience. And so like the more things I do and experience, the more things I have to share. And mm -hmm. like the more I get to share, the more excited I am. So it almost doesn't matter how miserable something is because I get a good story out of it and I get to share something and I learn something and, oh my God, check this out. This is what I did. How dumb am I <laughs> or whatever. Um, that kind of seems to be a, a theme in my life. <laughs> so, um, I've oh, definitely had lots of, lots of those. That sounds so gratifying. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I'm like, I want to, I want to turn it's, it's funny. I don't want to make this all, this all about me. Um, because I, I still have one or two more questions for you. Um, but there is a, uh, desire that I want to take everything I've done and, and funnel that into one endeavor, which is kind of what I'm trying to do. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if you relate to that because there are some similarities between you and I and how we do things. Um, and maybe it's in your art or maybe it's, you know, in what you're doing now. So I'm curious, so this kind of, I guess, leads me to like the last big question, which is like, how many times have you reinvented yourself or how many times have you, you know, started up a new path and, and, although you're really not starting from scratch, you're, you do kind of have that sense that you're starting over again and you're taking whatever you done before and applying it to the new thing. Uh, how many times have I reinvented myself? That's a difficult question. Or also, I mean, do you think you've reinvented yourself at all or just found new versions of yourself perhaps as maybe a different way of, of saying the same thing? Well, I no, I like that phrasing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, interacting with other people, I feel like I get to see through different mirrors more of myself and learn more about who I am. And yeah. I feel the same way about different experiences too. Um, and coming in with the mindset like like you just described of like, I'm just going to do it, whatever it is, and who knows how it's going to go. And maybe I'll get a good story out of it anyway. Like, I really like that. Um, I'm not always in that mindset for sure. I definitely have my, my times of dragging my feet, <laughs> resisting <laughs> life in general, but, um, it's funny. I literally find myself trying to narrate, um, my story as I go sometimes, like if I'm, especially if I'm really depressed because like things are not going well, I'm like, how am I going to tell this story later? <laughs> like I literally <laughs> ask myself, like, that's like, like, how am I going to turn this into a good story or a good lesson, uh, life lesson or something like that? It's, it's the weirdest thing. It's I have the weirdest self-talk. Cool. <laughs> I like that. Because... Maybe. <laughs> I mean, take, if it works for you, please take it. <laughs> Try it. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, in terms of how many times I've reinvented myself, I have no idea, but well, yes. if I can, okay. So if I can maybe aid you in answering the question, because I know you were a graphic designer, you went to art school, 
you are a real estate investor um, and now you have a farm. Goodness. So real estate investor. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you bought a property, you rented it out, you made money, you sold it, you bought a new property. That's a real estate investor. Yeah, I guess I just never had that title before. Interesting. None of it was intentional. That's not something I like tried to do. Uh and that's fair. I mean, I think that's probably some of the most amazing things that I've learned about people, um, whether it's through the through the show or just through life, is that uh, more often than not, they end up where they are because they just keep going, mm-hmm. not because of any intentional um, knowledge that like, I know I'm going to be a real estate investor. And, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I've got some extra money. This makes sense. I'm going to buy this and rent it out. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, uh, in general, things just don't go according to plan <laughs> and how much that affects me is based on how much I'm tied to that plan or not really. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. I studied graphic design. I did graphic design. I was on the East coast before and then I moved to LA because I found the weather so much better. Yeah. It's pretty nice out here. I didn't know that there was because I grew up overseas. I didn't learn about the U.S. in school, so I didn't know Mm. that there were different areas that had different types of weather, and I just thought it was kind of all the same thing, and then I learned that I didn't have to go through winter. Yeah, that's a funny thing. That's a funny thing to realize. That's 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 kind of cool and and odd all at the same time. Yeah, there's a lot of things I don't know. Well, Um, a lot of things (laughs) all of us don't know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know, right? So, you know, Precisely. <laughs> yes, I went to LA to design their freelancing, and then um, I got really into rock climbing. <laughs> yeah, which is how we kind of met originally is through through the rock climbing gym. Yeah, like that was life changing for me because that's probably the first time I'm connecting to my body, mm. like using it being aware of it like literally I didn't know how to I wasn't coordinated before I couldn't I couldn't hike without just like stumbling I still can't but I'm stronger (laughs) now Um, that was life-changing for me because that was also my access to the outdoors I had never really spent time outside before Mm. and then um, climbing led me to camping camping led me to find out that all these there are all these climbers living in their cars traveling and climbing and then I decided I wanted to do that so I bought a van and I was overconfident and it took me a year to build it out yeah that's yeah that's a big undertaking that's amazing that you did it though I am you on your own uh, I had help from various people so yeah. sometimes I'd be working on it in the parking lot of the climbing gym or on the side of my street with my extension cord popped out the window Nice. Uh, <laughs> in various places. It took me a long time. I won't say it was fun the whole time either. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't imagine it's always fun, but it's gotta be gratifying. It was gratifying because there, there was a point that I couldn't go back of like, if I stop here, I'm just going to regret this. Mm-hmm. And then I was traveling in my van and climbing and then freelancing, like going to Starbucks to send off work and stuff uh, until I I went too far on my own pendulum. And I was like, I, I just want a bathroom and a kitchen. <laughs> and then and then my grandmother had died about a year or so earlier and she had left some money to my family members mm-hmm. or all of the family, honestly. And so using that, I bought a house in Joshua Tree, a duplex, because all I wanted to do was just land. I I felt like on my life, I'd never had a home. I didn't even have a hometown. And I just wanted to like stay put. Yeah, it's interesting after so much travel growing up, all the different places you live that, you know, you come out west and then you put yourself in a van and make yourself, you know, uh, mobile all over again. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe you had unresolved, maybe you had some unresolved business in your, in your traveling. And by doing van life for a little while, it gave you the ability to exercise those travel demons. 
<laughs> travel demons. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, I did have this interesting experience of when I started building out the van, I, I got really close to a group of people, like a group of friends that I made who introduced me to like psychedelics and Burning Man and talking about our feelings and being doing whatever they just felt like doing. And they had this element of freedom and creativity and openness that I had mm. never had before in my life. And then I finished building up my van and I'm like, I'm going. <laughs> and then I drive off in my van and I'm like, just totally heartbroken and like so much emotional pain that I never had before, except when I was a child and I had moved to a new country. Mm. And at those times I had moved to a new place and it was like total reset. I don't know where I am. I usually don't speak a language. I've lost all my best friends. All the food is different. Actually, everything is different, even how the faucet is different. Wow, yeah. And then my parents are unable to, were unable to communicate about cultural differences or even just to talk about these things in general. We weren't the feelings talking about family. And your, was your dad from the States? Yeah, he's from a small town in Kentucky. Oh, wow. So he's a small Kentucky Southern boy that went off and became a diplomat and married a, a Taiwanese woman and, and then traveled the world for years with his family. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I do really admire my dad because he's always been extremely open-minded and just curious about everything. Well, it sounds like both your parents had to be to a certain extent for your mom to leave everything she knew in, in Taiwan and, you know, travel the world with him well yeah she was coming from taiwan in a time where it was very hard to leave the country it was just hard to get out and be away so i think for her that definitely was a huge like probably a, a release from where she, she was mm -hmm. she was yeah yeah wow that's fascinating so now that you're doing van life did you have a return to you know the um post 18 asking why what are the deep questions doing art and writing kind of free free form you know free association yeah in the sense of like um before i took off i had committed that i'm going to travel and i want to do a lot of it alone mm. by myself and the reason for doing that was because i was i was shy still i was i had social anxiety i i wanted to break out of something that I could not identify. And I knew that maybe if I just like jump on the ocean, I'll learn how to swim. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> one way to do it. And so I'm like leaving this group of friends to go and be in my van alone and just feeling this heartbreak and homesickness and forcing myself. And I think uh, I was still abiding by these old principles of um, be open to anything and just go for it, see what you mm. want. I was using that in, in connection to an, another belief I did not know I had developed. And the belief was through suffering, you'll learn. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that if I'm suffering, I'm growing and evolving. But I think I got a little off balance when mm -hmm. I was kind of like, you should be suffering. And if you feel bad, you should just lean into it. And yeah, suck it up. That was kind of this unspoken do you still have the belief um, that that you need to suffer? No. <laughs> okay. I didn't think you did, but I wasn't sure. So I was like, oh, I'm, part of me as a friend doesn't want to know. <laughs> I do, but I'm like, oh. Um, yeah, I heard the saying years ago, um, pain is mandatory, suffering is optional. And I love that saying because I feel like it's yeah, you're going to go through tough times, it's, you know, things are going to suck. Um, but how you deal with it is whether you suffer or not, you may feel the pain, but you don't have to suffer. And I, I feel like that's a, such a beautiful thing to understand and, and come to. Um, and it makes it easier to kind of see what your next move is, which is probably why you bought the house. Yes. I, I think, uh, <laughs> Slowly, I was going to realize that my suffering was a choice mm -hmm. and suffering was coming from what I was thinking about what was happening, not about what was actually happening. Um, so I kept suffering for quite a while. 
my self-imposed suffering. Um, As most of us do at some point in time or sometimes a long time, depending on, you know, where we're at in our lives. Yeah. And I will continue to encounter suffering and uh, I'm cool with that. <laughs> yeah. But it also sounds like you'll continue to make the choice to experience the pain, but no, you know, not let yourself suffer longer than you have to. Yes. Or longer. Yeah. No, nah, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just overly optimistic. I, I feel like you've, you've gotten this far. You're going to continue to, you know, get better and better and better at it. Yeah. And in the sense that like the goal hopefully is to identify when I'm doing my self-imposed thought suffering land yep. uh, and to wake myself out of it hopefully sooner and sooner as I go, or just, you know, return to the perspective that my suffering doesn't have to be a problem at all. My pain doesn't have to be an issue at all. No. It's merely if I'm resisting my pain, that it's, then I'm, I'm causing my pain there. Yeah. And that all pain is, can be honorable and, and yeah, live. absolutely. Yeah. Like, like night and day, we need both. We can't just have sunshine and blue skies all the time. No, because you won't enjoy, um, you won't be able to appreciate the highest unless you can also appreciate the lows. And there, there's the beauty in both the lows and the highs. And the more you appreciate the lows, the more you appreciate the highs and vice versa for different reasons. I agree in the sense yeah. of having awareness of it, of like, you know, I, I remember being like a kid and when I'd get sick and be like, unable to swallow without pain and a stuffy nose i'd be like oh, i'm so grateful for when i can breathe it like brings this light and joy to the moments of not pain yeah, yeah. i had a weird thing when i was a little kid where uh, especially during the summers where i didn't have as much to do where i would just make myself sick in the middle of the night so i'd have something to do and so I could, and I had something to experience because I knew I couldn't wake my family up because, you know, my parents had to work the next day and my sister would just be, you know, unhappy. And, um, so like I'd make myself sick and I, and I, I think the first couple of times it happened, I don't think I realized I was making myself sick, but I think after a little while, I realized I was making myself sick at what point, at which point, like, I was like, okay, so I just guess guess it just gives me something to do until I'm ready to fall asleep. And, and then as I got older, uh, it became, oh, good. I don't have to work today or I don't have to go to school or whatever it was. Like mm -hmm. I have my excuse to, you know, not, um, uh, not do anything. And then as I got yet even older, I realized that I could just make the choice not to do something <laughs> and take a break <laughs> instead of having to be sick. And I literally feel yeah. like I've been sick, you know, just two or three times in the last like five years because I just ran myself down. I wasn't for whatever reason, I wasn't able to give myself a break, uh, the, or the uh, right amount of downtime meditation or, or whatever. And it just, it got the better of me and I got sick. <laughs> it's funny how that works though. Yeah. That's really interesting. Oh so where you're, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you go ahead. Uh, um, so I, I, I feel like we can probably wrap this up, you know, soon, or at least this stage. And maybe if we want to do a round two, we can do a round two, but you know, where you're at now, you know, you've, you've started a farm and it sounds kind of accidental, like, because it was just like this, uh, thing you were doing with your partner and it sounds like it's really taken on a life its own um, do you like one how does it relate or how do you relate it or can you relate it to all of the things that you know you've we've talked about uh, today in terms of you know your coping mechanisms and kind of your outlook and your ability to you know shift your mindset and reframe things like is it I'm sure it's got its problems, but have you, how have you found it? Like, have you found it easier or have you found it more joyful or, um, is it just new challenges that you're enjoying? Excuse me. So what would, how would you kind of put that in the context of our, our previous conversation today? Um, let's see. Well, how I ended up having the farm and, and my partner was, was from a, a new shift. I sort of went through beforehand um 
So this is really just, you feel like an extension of a shift that happened like a year or two ago or a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'd oh, say uh, in, in the sense that I was living in, I was living in Topanga mm -hmm. um, and or LA area in general. And I was getting tired of it and I kind of wanted to do something differently. And I sort of made up my mind that I wanted to go live in Austin and just have a life there and I had plans that I was going to go to their really cool climbing gym there that they have and nice. and join this like community farm and, and whatnot basically I'd watched a documentary about sustainable living and it really 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 inspired me and I got really excited about it and I just kind of wanted to go towards that this wasn't the documentary um about the couple that had the dog I can't remember the name of that, but there's a, there's a documentary on sustainable <laughs> farming and actually the whole thing takes place in California, but they, oh. it was a couple that lived in LA. They got a, they, they adopted a dog and the dog right. basically got them kicked out of an apartment because it was too loud. They ended up buying a farm and spending the next couple of years learning how to do regenerative, all natural farming and cycling. Yeah. That's a, the biggest little farm. Yes. That's not the one that I saw. Okay. Um, I that's a great documentary I saw, though <laughs> i know it's, it's yeah. so beautiful yeah very inspiring we love yeah. it too. <laughs> um, i just watched a documentary i think it's called be the change or living the change and it was just showing different people in new zealand um, either having a food forest permaculture garden zero waste composting things that i like i didn't know anything about yeah. i I'd, I'd only like compost in the kitchen and in our place that kind of thing mm -hmm. Uh, so I made up my mind, I'm going to do this. It's going to be in Austin. I'm going to join the sick gym. I, I had like very like clear plans or whatnot. Of course, yeah. Uh, I found this cool tiny house and with this land I was going to live in. And I, I go out there and I drive and I get in the tiny house and things start falling apart. And the tiny house, the water goes out. It doesn't have any internet like they said it would. Uh, the, the driveway is so rocky and muddy and the trees are too low. It hits my van. Uh, just I like just, everything. I start getting like emotional and upset. Um, and then I leave that place and then I'm, I'm able to find my dream apartment, which is like walking distance from the climbing gym. It's actually the building I used to see when I would visit Austin and wow. I wanted to live there. And I was I was going to rent that place. I got my deposit in. I got it cheaper than what it was listed for because they hadn't even put it up. And I just called at the right time. And I was like feeling very good about myself of like, oh, look at that. I manifested that or whatever. Yeah. And then um, and then I went to like a women's conference not shortly after. And something about this man is basically just talking about women and intuition and women knowing the truth and whatnot. That's it. It's a huge, vague statement to say that's what I got out of it was this person basically speaking to a bunch of women and saying, do you know the truth? And then it, it like struck me really hard. Oh, I'm not supposed to go to Austin. Hmm. I'm not supposed to be in the relationship I'm in. I was hmm. dating someone else at the time. There was this sense of like, oh, that's not for you. Whereas my regular self was like, but I, but I got my dream apartment and I love Austin and I have like the best partner I've ever had in my life. I had like all of this like resistance, but there was also this like knowing in my body of like, no, that's not for you. It was very weird and it was very much, I never had that experience in my life of like directed inside, which was not what I was wanting. Well, I mean, it, it does sound a little bit like your experience in France um, when you found realized you're all alone. There is, to me, there is a uh, a similarity between those two moments. Yeah, it's like the 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 real self makes an appearance. It's, I mean, it's really, you know, what I, what I referenced earlier, you know, Socrates, the Buddha and Confucius, and that's the Buddha, that's the awakening. That's that stillness, that inner self saying, 
okay, let me speak up here for a second. <laughs> this is what's going on. Don't go to Austin. You know, it's that part of that wisdom, inner wisdom that we all have that got really turned up for whatever reason for yes. you, which is amazing. Yeah, I was definitely resisting it though. I was just like, but I already put down my deposit and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, well, ultimately I, I knew that if I didn't um, listen, then it would just be growing bigger and bigger and heavier mm. and heavier inside me. Uh, and essentially I came to the conclusion of that moment, which was, oh, I see that I can make the things that I wanna have happen, happen. They seem to happen for me when I put my energy in that direction. Well, what if I wasn't the one choosing anymore? And what if I was just being directed and allowed myself to be directed? What would happen then? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my, my shift into maybe I can just be quiet and listen and see what happens. Um, so I went to a retreat center outside of Tucson Mm -hmm. um, in the mountains where you can sort of, you can get individual, you can get your own little tiny space out in the mountain and they leave you alone for however long you want. You can just be by yourself in silence. That's cool. It is really cool. I didn't even know those things existed before. Um, and uh, on my way out there, I, I met my current partner at a dance event. We had matching hippie vans. <laughs> uh, He's the only person I've ever met in my age range, also randomly, who practices nonviolent communication, which is something important to me. Um, and then we, and then I went to my retreat center, had a tooth problem, had to go back to Tucson, mm. spent more time with him, came a couple, blah, 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 blah. That's interesting. Uh, just in case anyone is looking for a retreat center like that, do you remember the name of the retreat center off the top of your head? Yes. Uh, Diamond Mountain Retreats. Diamond center. Mountain Retreat Center. Okay. Diamond Mountain. Mm -hmm. And there's another question that I thought, and I completely lost it. So maybe it's not important. <laughs> uh, I'll probably listen back uh, to this afterwards and go, oh, Oh, well, you know, or I'll, I'll send you an email and, and then I'll put it in the show notes if I can think of what it was. Um, that's interesting. I mean, it's so fascinating because I feel like it sounds to me like, you know, that awakening you had at 18 into, you know, this life, you know, you maintained the openness to have that again and again. And, you know, that's how you ended up where you're at now. And um, I mean, that's really amazing. I mean, I, I think that's a, you know, fantastic accomplishment, you know, because you don't really get to say, you know, life sucks when you are, you know, creating the life that you want to live because if you don't like something you just change it yeah although i think through life sometimes we discover that we're not in those traps at all yeah i think there's the idea sometimes like i don't have a choice or it's too hard or i can't do it um i think that is the only thing that needs to change the belief system about it yeah yep. it's the only thing we really have power over anyway <laughs> And I think everything is temporary. Like as long as there's another day, then there's more time to change things mm -hmm. and not to get too esoteric, but you know, if there's life or consciousness after this existence, then even if there wasn't another day of breathing, there's still more time to change and grow and, and learn. So, um, and if there's nothing after this for those people who don't believe uh, in anything after this, then you don't have anything to worry about because you're <laughs> no longer thinking. So either way, it's a good thing. No you know, it's, 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 yeah, no pressure. Good stuff. Um, before, uh, before we kind of conclude it, do you have any kind of last thoughts or, or things that kind of, you know, piqued your, you know, interest that you want to say or that yeah. you didn't get to say earlier? Um, yeah, just touching upon what we just talked about. Um, 
I do remember being 18 and feeling so awful and basically like to the point of like I I don't know if I want to be alive anymore it's just I just feel nothingness I don't understand what the point is and just having no connection to genuine happiness or whatnot and a thought that came to mind was maybe there's something out there that I don't even have the capacity to understand or think of at this time perhaps there's something that I'll discover that I just can't even think of at this moment. I'm not gonna go looking for it, but what if there could be? And as, as the years have passed, I, I feel like I've encountered that many times of like developing relationships with friends so deep that I, I didn't know that was even possible to be so close to somebody or rock climbing. I didn't know it was possible for me to feel connected to my body. I didn't even have an awareness that I could have these sensations yeah. or in my current relationship, I didn't even know I could ever get this triggered. Like it goes. Yeah. Through. Relationships will do that sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's an amazing, that's a really amazing thing. And the, you know, for me, because I do believe in, in, consciousness beyond this physical existence you know i've i've said it in other episodes that you know i'm i'm more of the mind we are spiritual beings having physical experiences um than physical beings having uh you know spiritual experiences and and so from my perspective that experience of kind of total annihilation in when you were 18, because I've definitely experienced that before as well. And having an inkling that maybe there's something more is the something more just, you know, because it, maybe it would be too intense, too much to have, you know, this, this experience of, you know, we'll I'll call it an awakening where you're seeing things or hearing things, you know, maybe that's too much. And so the spirits, the energy, the universe, God, however you want to refer to it, is just get, giving you a gentle, be open, be open to something more. That's all you have to do. Like, it doesn't matter what, just be open and open to the possibility. And I feel like that's maybe possibly the greatest, most simplest, easy gift that we can get, you know, from just sitting still for a minute. Yes, I, I agree with that too, that we, we get what we need when we get a little help here and there too. Yeah, a little subtle nudge. And and that's uh, that's that's proof enough to keep going, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been feeding me ever since then of like recognizing like I didn't know about this life I could have with my partner. I didn't know about sustainability really until like, three years ago, watching a documentary, how excited I got from it. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I feel like that's a, that's the kind of the perfect ending place um, for, for now, anyhow. And um, so thank you. Thank you again for, for doing this with me. And don't forget to leave a comment or a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts. New episodes every Tuesday and check us out on YouTube for short clips from each episode. Thank you. And until next time, remember, your life story is yours to write and rewrite as many times as you want.